Ahoy Shikni. When you grew up in California, like I did, history is something that happened somewhere else. Most American history happened 3,000 miles from us. I'm sure those smart Boston kids grew up visiting the Revolutionary War sites and got to see where their ancestors dumped the tea in the harbor. But kids in California are like, what was here before us? And their teachers are like, well, there were some natives and then there were some missionaries and best not to ask too many questions. Have you seen the garage where HP was founded? And then that California kid moves to Prague and shows up at their office, which is closed for a holiday she's never heard of. And so, like that inquisitive history buff her California school system raised her to be, she happily goes back home and climbs into bed. That particular holiday, celebrated every year on the 17th of November, is not one, but two state holidays rolled into a 50-year struggle for freedom and democracy, which is actually the name of one of the holidays, but we'll get to that in a minute. The first thing you should know is that neither of these holidays would have been possible without the participation of certain students. Czech university students, to be precise. Now, I want you to think back to your university days. You probably had more passion than sense. Probably a little brash, a little impulsive. So I want you to remember your early 20-something self as I tell you the story of these brave Czech university students. Now, we Americans have our Independence Day as if someone woke up one day and handed us a hot dog and a sparkler and we had our independence. Of course we know there was some struggle made by somebody about 3,000 miles away several hundred years ago, but it's hard for us to really relate to it. But for the Czechs, everything we celebrate on this holiday happened in the last hundred years and much of it in living memory. And if you live in Prague, you are literally walking the streets of where it happened every day and you probably don't even know it. So today, we're gonna to take a little virtual tour of 20th century Prague to visit some of the places and some of the people that made these two holidays happen. We start our tour in Munich, Germany. Not in Prague, true, but integral to the story. Back in 1938, the biggest threat on the streets of Europe was Hitler's growing popularity and ambition. To curtail his efforts, France, England, and Italy decided to wiggle out of their commitments to stand by their ally, their ally, Czechoslovakia. See, Hitler wanted to take control of the Sudetenland. This is some border territory around former Czechoslovakia that had a lot of ethnic Germans. Do you ever notice how Germany looks like a giant Pac-Man trying to eat the Czech Republic? It's an aggressive shape. Hitler promised these world leaders that all he wanted was control over the Sudetenland. And everyone believed him, except for the Czechs. And they were right. Never one for keeping promises, Hitler, a few months later, rolled his tanks right into what he now claimed was the Bohemian Moravian Protectorate. You can even see him on a postage stamp at Prague Castle, which gives me the heebie-jeebies every time I see it. Now the Czechs and Slovaks had only just 20 years prior gained their independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 20 years ago is not that long. I'm still wearing the same jeans I bought 20 years ago. Back in style. Point being, 20 years goes by like this, I'm discovering. Fast forward six months and the Czechs find themselves celebrating this independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire under Nazi control. You can see how that would put a damper on the celebration, to say the least. Enter the students. In Newtown, Prague, just a few blocks east of the river, stands one of the most famous dorms in the Czech Republic, Plavkova Kolej. This dorm was built specifically for students without a lot of money but they had to be smart. This was the smart kids dorm. We didn't have a smart kids dorm at my university. Or at least they didn't 
invite me to live there. In Plavkova, Kole lived a 24-year-old fourth-year medical student named Jan Opletal. Jan was the eighth child in a very poor family, but he was very engaged and very smart. So on this celebration of the birth date of Czechoslovakia as an independent nation, he and his fellow students took to the streets and distributed flyers. They gathered in groups and sang the national anthem. Some of them even threw stones at German-owned businesses and called for resistance against the Nazis. More passion than sense. And they encouraged the Czech populace to join them. In total, over 100,000 Czechs took to the streets. Another young man in this crowd was 22-year-old Václav Sedláček. He was an apprentice baker in a bakery in Smíhov. In this crowd with Opletal and Sedláček were thousands of protesters gathering from Vodičkova Street to Charles Square, but the Nazi police forced them to go up Žitna Street. The police started to put down the protest violently, and over 400 people were injured in the process. The German policemen started to shoot into the crowd. An unknown shooter killed Sedláček, who died at the scene, and another shooter killed Opletal, who died a week later of his injuries. Sedláček's death was mostly hushed up by the Nazis. It was not reported in the press. His funeral was only allowed to be small in his village with his close family and friends, and it was heavily monitored by the Nazi police. While Opletal's funeral on November 15th was another thing altogether. Once again, thousands of students gathered together at Albertov near the medical university. They went there to see his casket at, as it was taken by chariot to the train to go back to Moravia where he would be buried. The gathering grew into a spontaneous anti-Nazi demonstration with Czechs singing the national anthem and crying out for the end of Nazi occupation. Protests took place in other Czech cities as well, Ostrava and Pilsen, Hradec Kralove and Příbram. The news of this unrest went all the way to Hitler, and he told his officers to respond with the greatest force. In the middle of the night, the SS headed to Hlavkova Kole, ripped students in their pajamas out of bed, beat them if they had to. And they did this in dorms all over Prague and in dorms throughout the country. These students were all taken to holding cells in Pankrat and in Vruznie, near the airport. If they were under 20, they were released. But if they were over 20, think of what a small difference that is, 21, 22, how much more mature can you be? They were then sent to concentration camps. At the Ruznie barracks, nine of the leaders of student organizations were shot. And this was the first instance of the Nazis executing Czechs without a trial, but it wouldn't be the last. Over 1,200 students were taken to a concentration camp outside Berlin, and several died there. The next day, the 17th of November, the Nazis ordered all of the Czech universities in the country to be closed. This was to last three years, and it ended up lasting the length of the war. 15,000 students were unable to attend university, and over 1,300 professors, associate professors, and teachers were immediately unemployed. You can see why this would be the greatest threat for, for an oppressive regime. You know, students are idealistic. They are young and they don't understand maybe death. They don't see the consequences in front of them. It's almost like they have nothing to lose. And that idealism can really fuel a movement, and that's what Hitler was afraid of. Now, some historians believe that Opletal's funeral was allowed to get this big and to get this um, rowdy on purpose so that the Nazis could use it as a pretext to close the universities. Not that Nazis ever needed a pretext to do anything, but there you have it. 
in commemoration for this closing of the universities and for the students who had been killed, two years later in London, International Students' Day was declared and it was celebrated by many countries around the world. This is the only holiday which originated in the Czech Republic which is celebrated internationally. The Czechs love to be celebrated internationally, as they should be. So we have state holiday number one, International Students' Day, celebrated every year on the 17th of November. But the struggle had just begun. But of course you knew that. Fast forward 50 years, we have a whole new generation of brash, impulsive, passionate students and a whole new group of oppressors. After World War II, when Hitler was defeated, the Czechs and the Slovaks were free again. And then the communists wiggled their way into government, and what followed was 40 years of political oppression. So in November 1989, International Students' Day is approaching, and the Czechs find themselves celebrating under another oppressive regime. Do you see a pattern here? struggle. So again, another group of university students organized a gathering, several thousand people to commemorate the holiday, the students who had died in 1939 and the closing of the schools. They also used it as a platform to denounce the communist regime. The protests started out in Albertov, where Jan Opletal's funeral had started. Albertov seems to be the, the cradle of student revolution in this country. I feel like every story that spans 50 years has to have its Forrest Gump. And so we have Josef Sharka. He was a participant in Jan Opletal's funeral in 1939. He had lived in Slavkova Kole with Jan Opletal and knew him. And he was invited to speak at Albertov in 1989 and to denounce the communist regime, showing us that 50 years is not that long of a time either. So the protest moved from Albertov up to Vyshehrad, where everyone gathered around the tomb of the Czech poet Maha. Now, he is very famous for writing the poem May, and he has a statue in Petschin, but I can't figure out the significance of why they all laid flowers at Maha's grave in this, in this protest. So if you can educate me and the rest of my viewers what the significance of Maha was, please tell me in the comments below. Once they were up at Vishirad, they were supposed to disperse and go home. But many of them wanted to go to the center. They wanted to go to Václavské náměstí. Wenceslas Square. But the communist regime did not want this to happen. As the protesters left Vishirad, they walked down the river towards Narodny Dvadlo, and the police had blocked off Legi Most so that they couldn't advance to the castle. So they made a right at Narodny and started walking towards Narodny Trida. When they approached Narodny Trida, they realized that there were police forces there and the police started to come at them from behind. So they were mostly stuck on Narodny, where if you live in Prague, you probably go countless times a week. The students, brash, impulsive, passionate, chose the path of nonviolence. The Czechs gave flowers to the police officers and tried to show their, their peaceful resistance, but the police did not. They started to beat them with batons, even though they were unarmed. The students started chanting, we have bare hands, you have to protect us. But the police wouldn't stop. So some of the students started to scatter down the alleyways by Narodny Trida. It was the only way out. There was a rumor that a student had died at these protests named Martin Schmidt which turned out not to be true, but the rumor of this fueled the society and angered everyone. And it, over the next several weeks, it turned into a passionate protest against communist rule. And this day, this action of the students on the 17th of November started the Velvet Revolution. It's called Velvet because it took place without violence, except for the night 
of the 17th of November. And now this day is celebrated as the Struggle for Freedom and Democracy Day. Emphasis on struggle. As I was researching these holidays, I started to wonder if my 22-year-old self would have been as sacrificing, as brave, as passionate as these students were. I'd like to think that we would all rise to the occasion if the circumstances required it. Um, but for me, it's just enough to walk the streets of Prague and to know that these events happened. They happened recently to people who are still alive and they happened everywhere you look. So if you haven't been to Prague in a while or if you've never been, um, I hope that you can visit some of these spots and get a little bit more meaning out of them when you do. Tak, uvidíme se příští týden. Ahoj!